yeah we are covering the book of zechariah so before the break we started to look at some of the prophecies about the messiah which are given in this book of zechariah we looked at zechariah 99 uh, which talks about how the messiah will come when he comes and we saw that he would come riding on a donkey rather than on a war horse to bring judgment um another important prophecy that we can look at uh, is to be found in zechariah chapter 14 verses 3 and 4 uh, if someone could read out for us zechariah 14 verses 3 and 4 please zechariah 14 verses mm. 3 and 4 then the lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle on that day his feet shall stand on the mount of olives that lies before jerusalem on the east and the mount of olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move no- northward and the other half southward now in this passage um zechariah 14 uh, passage it talks about the end times when uh, the nations will want to fight against god the nations you know uh, which uh, do not want to submit to the lord and honor him and obey him all these nations will gather against god to fight against him on that day it says the lord will come and he will stand on the mount of olives and the mount of olives will split into two is what it says and this actually is talking about the second coming of christ uh if we were to look at acts chapter 1 maybe we can just look at verses 11 and 12 acts chapter 1 if someone could read out verses 11 and 12 then we will see the link between you know these two passages acts chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 and said men of galilee why do you stand looking unto heaven this jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven well also ma'am well yeah well then they returned to jerusalem from the mount called olive which is near jerusalem a sabbath day's journey away so we see here in acts chapter 1 verse 12 that jesus ascended into heaven from the mount of olives and now in zechariah we are told in chapter 14 that one day when he comes back he will come back and stand on the mount of olives so zechariah 14 3 and 4 is actually a prophecy talking about the second coming of jesus when he will descend onto the mount of olives um this one particular verse in zechariah which has uh, been are uh, touched upon in many of the new testament verses that would actually be zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 almost every phrase in that particular verse is repeated in some new testament verse or the other uh, so let's look at that zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 shall i read ma'am yeah zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 and i and i will pour out on the house of david and the inhabitants of jerusalem a spirit of grace and place for mercy so that when they de- when they look on me on him whom they have pierced they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn the the uh, terms and phrases which are used over here in this particular uh, verse they are repeated in the new testament because all of these terms and phrases are actually talking about jesus for instance um it says they will look on me the one they have pierced so in john chapter 19 verses 36 and 37 we see the fulfillment of that how when jesus was hanging on the cross you know the soldiers come to him and they pierce him with a spear and at that time water and blood comes out from the side 
Uh, so um, in uh, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, this particular thing is actually referred to. It talks about the one that they have pierced. And that phrase is used uh, also in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. If someone can read out that, Revelation 1, verse 7. Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. So here it says, um, look, he is coming with the clouds. That, of course, is the, you know, it's talking about the second coming. Every eye will see him even those who pierced him and all the peoples of the earth will mourn because of him this is uh, this is exactly what was you know prophesied in zechariah 12:10 where it says they will look on me the one they have pierced and they will mourn so at that time when the second coming happens then the nations will realize that this is indeed the living god and then they will mourn and say oh why did we not submit to him? You know, why have we continued to pierce him? You know, in a, in a metaphoric sense. So those who have accepted the Lord, they are now, uh, you know, in the kingdom of God. But those who have rejected him, when they see with their eyes the king of kings, you know, descending, they will recognize that it was them, their sinfulness, which pierced him. And now they will moan and think, why did we do that? Because of that, you know, judgment is now coming upon us. Uh, so um, both in John chapter 19 and Revelation 1, it talks about how Jesus was pierced. The phrase about him being an only child, um, that phrase is found in, um, in John 3.16, where, where you have, you know, uh, how Jesus is described over there as God's one and only son. So that phrase is also... Uh, to be found in Zechariah chapter 12. And then the very last portion where it says, grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. That term firstborn son, that also is mentioned in the New Testament um, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Um, yeah, if someone could read out that, Colossians 1 15. Colossians 1 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Exactly. So that particular phrase, the firstborn, is used in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. So Zechariah is just, you know, this last few chapters, now chapters 9 to 14, are filled with lots of prophecies about the Messiah who will come about what he will, uh, you know, how he will come, what are the events which will take place when he comes. All those details are described. And these de details were given about the Messiah, you know, many, many um, hundreds of years uh, before Jesus came onto the earth. So these are all accurate prophecies about the Messiah. Um, there's one more passage that maybe we could look at. Uh, Zechariah chapter 11. Now, this is not a passage which is very popular. Uh, not many people talk about it, but it's interesting. Uh, the, the, the story which is conveyed in this Zechariah chapter 11 uh, is quite significant. So maybe we will look at this particular passage, uh, Zechariah chapter 11. If you look at the NIV Bible, uh, the heading will say two shepherds. Uh, but then some people, they think about this passage as a story of four shepherds. Um, let's begin by looking at Zechariah chapter 11, verse 3, which gives us some kind of an introduction. Okay, so Zechariah chapter 11, verse 3, if someone could read out. The sound of the well of the shepherds for their glory is ruined. The sound of the roar of the lions, for the thicket of the Jordan is ruined. All right. 
here in this verse you have shepherds who are wailing and crying and in this verse you also have young lions being mentioned you know roar lions which are roaring they are mentioned and of course it also talks about you know the shepherds so obviously we have to understand the sheep also must be there you know with the shepherds so if you can if you combine the picture of the lions which are roaring with the picture of the shepherds who are wailing what do you think has happened to the sheep you know obviously it means that probably the ro the roaring lions have attacked the sheep and therefore the shepherds are wailing and crying so this is the introduction that we are given so the the shepherds are weeping because something very bad has happened to the sheep and then with that introduction you know the passage starts talking about um a set of events this is basically the the set of events which take place now what we read over here in verse 11 uh, chapter 11 verse 3 is actually the conclusion of the entire story so the end of the story the shepherds wail and the shepherds weep but what happens at the beginning of the story that would be verse 4 onwards so zechariah chapter 11 verse 4 onwards we start being told a story about shepherds and sheep uh, maybe we can have someone read out verse 5 zechariah 11 verse 5 those who buy them slaughter them and go unpunished and those who sell them say blessed be the lord i have become rich and their own shepherd have no pity on them so in zechariah 11 verses 4 to 6 it talks about shepherds who are evil it talks about shepherds who don't care about their sheep okay so maybe we can talk about these shepherds as the first category of shepherds shepherds who are cruel shepherds who have no heart for the sheep shepherds who don't care what happens to the sheep and what are these particular shepherds doing over here in the imagery which is used in this particular portion verses 4 to 6 they are taking the sheep which god has given to them and rather than looking after the sheep they are selling the sheep to the slaughterhouse so that they you know that they can make money from the sheep so these leaders were appointed to look after the sheep but rather than looking after the sheep they are selling the sheep to be slaughtered so that they can make money from this uh, from this kind of a deal so this is the kind of shepherds uh, that are there and the sheep are being slaughtered and the situation is very very you know uh, serious and then this is what happens um in verses 7 to 14 maybe we can have someone read out verse 7 sekrayo 11 verse 7 so i became the shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered by the sheep traders and i too i took two stabs one i named favor and the other i named union and i tended the sheep so even as these sheep are suffering under these evil cruel shepherds a good shepherd comes along and he says i will take over the sheep because you know the, the the flock are being marked for slaughter uh the flock are being oppressed so i will take over the sheep and i will look after them so this new shepherd the good shepherd what does he do he has two staffs he has two rods with him he calls one favor and he calls the other one union basically it's to indicate that you know from now on my favor will rest upon the sheep i will look after them i will take care of them and then the other staff the other rod is named union in the sense he will bring all the sheep together and make them into one single flock now you know even as we are reading these verses what comes to our mind it brings to us a picture of jesus the shepherd right because um, he um, cares for the sheep he rescues the sheep which are being slaughtered by the false leaders and he is a good shepherd 
and then we see something in verses 8 onwards uh, from verses 8 to 14 mm. if we could have someone read out for us maybe 8 to 10 yeah what is the response of the sheep are the sheep very very happy to be having such a nice shepherd what is the response of the sheep verses 8 to 10 in one month i destroyed the three shepherds but I became impatient with them, and they also detested me. So I said, I will not be your shepherd. What is to die, let it die. What is to be destroyed, let it be destroyed. And let those who are left devour the flesh of one another. And I took my staff favor, and I broke it, involving the covenant that I had made with all the peoples. And then verse 14. 14. Yeah. Then, then I broke my second staff union, enveloping the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So a good shepherd has now come. He has, you know, uh, destroyed these bad shepherds who were there. And he has taken over the flock. But the flock is not grateful. The flock are not even happy that a good shepherd is now looking after them. And it says, the flock detested me, and I grew weary of them. And I said, I will not be your shepherd. Let the dying die, and the perishing perish. So even though this good shepherd wanted to bring good to the, uh, to the sheep, the sheep rejected him. The sheep did not want him. And so he takes these two staffs, you know, the shepherd staff, which are with are there, which are there with him. He takes the shepherd, the staff, which is called favor, and he breaks it because he is saying, "I am now breaking the covenant which I made with you." He takes the other staff, which is called union. He breaks that as well uh, as a symbol that Judah and Israel will no longer be joined together, but they would be divided. Um, so even as we are reading this particular portion, the picture which comes to our mind is how God wanted to bring all the Israelites together under his. But the people, instead of appreciating what God is offering them, what do they do? Uh, they say, we want a human king. We don't, we, we, we don't want to have you as our shepherd. We want a human shepherd. And so, you know, uh, God... Uh, allows them to go to the uh, human shepherds, the kings who are placed over them, and the kings have no sincerity. The kings do not honor the Lord until finally a stage comes where Israel and Judah are divided. Uh, so we get that image from this particular portion. Let's move on a little further into verses 15 and 16. So what happens now uh, if someone can read out verses 15 and 16? Then the Lord said to me, Take once more the equipment of a full, fully shepherd. For behold, I am raising up in the land a shepherd who does not care for those who are being destroyed, or seek the young, or heal the maimed, or nourish the healthy, but divorce the flesh of the fat ones, tearing off even their hopes. Now, um, it talks about how. Uh, God is now going to turn over these sheep who are not at all interested in him. He's going to turn them over to one very evil shepherd, you know, who will take advantage of them, a foolish shepherd who will not care for them. Uh, and uh, so uh, the Lord turns the people over to this kind of a shepherd. Now, even as we are going through this particular passage, how do you think the Israelite people would have understood it in the Old Testament times when Zechariah first gave them the story of these four shepherds? So you have the evil shepherds, first category. Then you have a good shepherd who comes, but the sheep don't care, care for him. And so this good shepherd turns the people over to a foolish shepherd who's the third category. And because of the way this foolish shepherd leads the people, the sheep are now in a very, very bad condition. And so you have the first shepherds, you know, the, the shepherds who are watching all of this, they weep 
and they wail and they cry and they say, oh, the sheep are being lost. The sheep are being destroyed. So even as the people of Israel listened to this prophecy, it would have reminded them of their Israelite history, how God offered to be their king, but they did not want him to be their shepherd. So what did they do? They said, we want to go, we want to have human kings. And the human kings uh, began to take advantage of the people, put taxes on them, exploit them, rather than looking after them, especially King Solomon, who said that he wanted to lead the people in a godly manner, in a wise manner, but who became so greedy for wealth and power that he began to impose heavy taxes on the people and you know, caused them to suffer a lot. As a result of which, uh, when his son came to the throne, the kingdom was divided into Judah and Israel. You know, it, the, the bond between these two, um, uh, these two portions of the kingdom was completely broken. So these are some of the details which should have come to the minds of the people when they first listened to this prophecy. But there are implications in this chapter even for New Testament people. Because when we read this, uh, these, these verses about the Good Shepherd, it reminds us of Jesus. It reminds us of how he has chosen to gather all the people under him as one single flock. And then, uh, you know, it, it says over here in the Zechariah 11 passage that the flock did not want to stay under the Good Shepherd. They, were, they grew weary of him and they wanted to go away to other shepherds. And if you take it in the New Testament context, then when God says, the sheep which are not interested in coming under my covering, I will allow them to be taken by a foolish shepherd, we could say that maybe in this prophecy, God is talking about how one day he will allow an antichrist to come and take over all the people who are not interested in coming under the covering of the Good Shepherd. So there's an, there's an Old Testament interpretation which can be given to this prophecy. There is also a more detailed uh, interpretation which can be given uh, if we are looking at it in the context of the New Testament. There's especially one small portion, verses 12 and 13, which make it appear that we should actually look at this passage in the in the in the you know in the sense of the new testament so let's read out those two verses 12 and 13 if someone could read out verses 12 and 13 then i said to them if it seems good to you give me my wages but if not keep them and they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver then the lord said to me throw it to the porter the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the porter. Now what does this remind us of this portion about the 30 pieces of silver which were paid to the shepherd? What does that remind us from the New Testament? Any thoughts? Exactly. So you have a good shepherd who comes to offer himself to the people and say, I will be your shepherd. You know, so those of you who believe in me, come under my covering. But what do the people say? The people say, no, we don't want the shepherd. We want to have the Pharisees. We want to have other leaders. Because this good shepherd, he, his standards are very high. We don't want to follow him. So here in the Zechariah 11 passage, the shepherd says, all right, if the people don't want me, fine. You give me my wages, I'll go away. You know, let, let the uh, some foolish shepherd look after the sheep later on. And so at that point, in this particular story, which is being told to us, the shepherd is paid 30 pieces of silver. And the shepherd says, what a small amount they have paid me. I mean, what I did for them is so great. What I wanted to, you know, my, the favor which I wanted to show them was so great. But they valued me only as worthy of 30 pieces of silver. And so in the story, the shepherd says, you know, it's like worthless almost. I'll take this amount and just throw it to the potter. And we see this 
being fulfilled in new testament times where you know the pharisees they value jesus for as being valuable enough for maybe about 30 pieces of silver so they they say to judas you know i think your master is maybe about this much in value so we are willing to pay this much for you to betray him are you willing and judas you know grabs that amount but then later when he is you know convicted of his um, sinfulness he throws those pieces of silver in the potter's field so you find a parallel uh, you know between the zechariah 11 passage and the events which took place in the new testament and so today our duty as the church of god is to bring as many people as possible under the covering of the good shepherd because if we do not bring the people under the covering of the good shepherd then they will choose to go after foolish shepherds the foolish shepherds will be shepherds who do not care for the people and they will uh, you know allow the people to be torn by the lions in other words to be torn by the evil forces by satan and his demons so we are we have been sent out on a mission to bring people under the good shepherd so that they are not deceived and oppressed and you no know, uh, betrayed by the evil dark forces uh, um, of satan so this is what uh, so this this parallelism is brought out through the uh zechariah 11 passage which indirectly actually talks about jesus the good shepherd okay so um those are just some of the things that we looked at from the book of zechariah uh let's move into the book of malachi the very last book of the uh, old testament now in the book of malachi um yeah we have a response here uh sanjay pointed out that it is judas yes um the students in the class and all of our, all of our students online are all awake and paying attention that's very encouraging thank you so book of malachi now the book of malachi was approximately uh, you know uh, i mean malachi did his ministry approximately maybe uh, at the time of nehemiah and also uh, maybe a little beyond that so after nehemiah came to jerusalem rebuilt the walls after that he tries to bring about many reforms he tries to you know uh, um encourage the people to return to the lord to faithfully observe the sabbath to give up all their foreign wives who are you know idol worshipers he tries to bring about all of these reforms and then um, in uh, nehemiah chapter 12 chapter 13 he has to go back to persia on some official work so when he goes back to persia the people you know backslide and they get back into their old sinful ways so when nehemiah comes back in chapter 13 the people have stopped observing the sabbath the people are now uh, you know um uh, not paying their tithes so a lot of wrong practices have crept in and nehemiah is very very angry and he scolds the people and he says you know why have you turned away from the lord and so all of those things happen so approximately around that time malachi was you know used by god to talk to the people and uh, in the book of malachi there are six disputes which are mentioned it's like to uh, six disputes between god and the people so the first dispute is covered in um the first uh, in, in chapter 1 the first few verses the first five verses where the lord says to the people you know i have always loved you and the people say ha huh, how have you loved us you know you're you're not doing any great miracles for us so then god says uh maybe we can actually read out those verses yeah malachi chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 if someone could read out please if i have loved you says the lord but you say have, how have you loved us is not a south jacob's brother declares the lord yet i have loved jacob but is how i have hated i have led west his hill country and left his heritage to jacobs of the desert 
So in spite of everything that God has done for the exiles after bringing them back, the people are not grateful. And so the Lord reminds them and tells them, I have loved you, I have shown you favor. And the people, they, they dispute against God and they say, in what way have you loved us? In what way have you been good to us? And the Lord says, did I not choose you as my, pe as my covenant people? Because you see, when um, Esau and Jacob were still in the womb of their mother, uh, God decided that he would choose Jacob and his descendants you know, as part of his covenant. And um, in those days, you know, in the time of Genesis especially, the elder son would have received first priority. But God chooses to show mercy to the younger son, even though Jacob is going to be the second twin, you know, even though Jacob is born second. So God is basically pointing out the fact that from the beginning, even though Jacob was not the first son, God chose the younger son and decided to show him mercy and make him part of his covenant. Um, and we see that actually mentioned, you know, even in um, Romans chapter 9. If someone could read out Romans chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. Romans chapter 9, verses 10 to 13. Romans chapter 9, verse 10 to 13. And not only so, but also when Rebecca and uh, Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call. She was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob, I loved you, but Esau, I hated. Now over here, it's very, very clearly clarified for us in Romans chapter 9. You know, God did not choose Jacob because Jacob had done something good. God did not choose Jacob because, you know, he had been, he was superior in any way. The two babies were still inside the womb. The two babies had not done anything good. They had not done anything bad. They were not even born yet. At that time itself, God chooses the younger child just to show mercy, just to appoint him as the covenant child, simply out of his grace and mercy. And so God gave them the greatest favor of, being, of becoming the covenant people of God, even though their ancestor Jacob was actually the younger son, actually did not deserve that kind of, you know, privilege. So God says, at that time, I could have chosen Esau. And Esau and his descendants would have been my people. But in my mercy and kindness, I chose your ancestor, Jacob. So in fact, no, um, um, Paul brings up that point in Romans chapter 9 to make a point. Because the Jewish people were very upset and they were saying, you know, this Jesus is bringing all the pagans into our community. And he is saying that they are part of the community of the living God. And so they were very, very angry. And so Paul says, why are you Jews protesting so much about the Gentiles who are coming into the kingdom of God? Your ancestor also didn't deserve any special treatment. Your ancestor was the younger son. So he should not have got any special privilege. But God in his mercy and grace chose the younger son and made him the covenant child. So now in the same way, God is showing mercy to these Gentiles and bringing them into the kingdom. So then in the same way, you people received special treatment. Now God is giving the same special treatment even to the Gentiles. So he tries to bring out this point in Romans chapter 9. And so he says, what then shall we say is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So... God chose Jacob and showed him compassion and made him the covenant person through whom his descendants would be established, even though Jacob had no special qualifications over and above Esau when they were both in the womb. Okay, so 
God says, from that time, my favor has been upon you, Israelites. And you have not appreciated that. Okay, so the Lord, you know that this can happen even with us. Just because we are not having all our answer, you know, all our prayers answered. Just because God is not giving us all the miracles that we are asking for. Like these people, we may say to the Lord, in what way have you loved us? In what way have you been kind to us? You know, we can have that attitude of bitterness where rather than being grateful for the status which God has given us, we can, you know, say, oh, my prayer is unanswered. In what way have you loved us? So we could be critical, but, you know, this passage reminds us that God is pointing out the status, the high status that has been granted to us as children of God. So sometimes our focus is on the unanswered prayers and we forget what we have been made. Imagine we who were sinners destined for hell, we have now been brought into a covenant with the living God. You know, our future is guaranteed. We will one day be with him and for eternity we will always stay with him. What a privilege has been given to us. So we should not be grumbling about unanswered prayers and saying, oh, you have not given me this. Oh, you did not, you did not do that particular thing in the way I asked you to do it. In what way have you loved us? It's such a silly allegation to make against God when we look at the kind of privilege, the covenant status that has been granted to us. So here, these people, these exiles who have come back to, the, to Jerusalem, rather than being grateful to the Lord, they say to him, in what way have you loved us? And this is the Lord's reply. He reminds them and shows them, you know, I chose the younger son, even though there was nothing special about him, just out of my compassion and mercy. So right from that time, my favor has rested upon you people and you need to be grateful for that. Um, the second dispute is, uh, is, uh, the, is something that God raises up against the priests. So in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, um, yeah, maybe we can actually read out Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, if someone could read out. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name, but you say, how have we despised your name? So now the, the Lord is coming to the second dispute which he has against the people. He says, a son honors his father, a slave honors his master, but you people have no honor for me at all. You know, so he says, and he's talking specifically to the priests. And he says, you priests are showing contempt for my name. You know, a slave, he honors his master. But you people have no honor for me, even though you're supposed to be my priests. Uh, you're in fact showing contempt for my name. And the priests, they reply and say, ah, in what way have we shown contempt? In what way have we you know, dishonored you? And so then God talks about the kind of offerings which these priests are accepting. The people are bringing leftovers to the temple. Rather than giving their best to the Lord as an offering, they are bringing defective animals to be offered. You know, in, um, in the Torah, in the first five books, very clearly God gave instructions on what kind of animals should be offered as a sacrifice. But here... The people are bringing defective animals. And what are the priests doing? The priests should correct the people, right? They should say, what you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is dishonorable. But rather than correcting them, they are accepting those defective animals and they are offering the sacrifices. Um, and so this is what the Lord says in uh, Malachi chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. If someone could read out Malachi 1, 12 and 13. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted and its fruit, that is its food may be despised. But you say, what a weariness is, this is, and you snort at it, says the Lord of hosts. 
you bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or sick and this you bring as your offering shall i accept that from your hand says the lord the lord says over here in these verses you people are so disinterested in serving me that when you know when these defective animals are brought you just you know you sniff and you say in a very contemptuous manner uh, oh what a burden it's like you know they're not even interested in correcting the people they just take those defective animals they sacrifice it because you know it's a ritual which they have to do so the lord says is this the attitude with which you are you are serving me you are not even honoring me you know either uh, honoring the lord's name or in fact even honoring him in front of the people and this can be the attitude of you know our, us believers when we are serving the lord sometimes we almost act like as if we are doing god a favor and we say oh what a burden to serve him and so whatever we can do we just do it half heartedly you know because it has to be done after all you know god is god so we have to serve him so what to do it's such a headache so much work such a strain but you know because we have to do it oh let's do it whatever is possible you know we'll just put together some effort and give him whatever we can give now if we were to do that it would be the same as what these people were doing in the time of malachi the priests rather than correcting the people and saying why are you bringing defective offerings take them back bring your best instead of correcting the people they were just simply taking whatever was being offered placing it on the lord's table sacrificing it and then saying oh the lord's table is defiled so the lord says you know do not speak in that manner because he says in verse 8 you know if this kind of sacrifice was given to the governor you think the governor would have accepted it when the governor himself won't accept such sacrifices why are you offering such sacrifices to me the living god so um here this passage teaches us that serving the lord should not be a burden we should not be sniffing contemptuously and saying ah what to do this is a burden that we have to bear no serving the living god is not a burden it is an honor it is a privilege we should be giving him our very best and if we are leaders with people under us we should be encouraging them and correcting them and urging them to give their best to the lord as well so the whole attitude of the people who were serving the lord at that time was very very wrong and god touches upon this uh, on the on this aspect the third dispute that the lord brings against the people is that they are now getting into a lot of divorces they are breaking up their marriages the people whom they have you know the israelite women whom they have married they are now rejecting them because they are attracted by the uh, foreign women and their foreign gods so rather than staying faithful within their own marriages they are divorcing their wives so that they can go and marry these foreigners and once they marry the foreigners they also start following those foreign gods so god uh, is upset about that as well and in uh, in fact the lord says that you know they should be faithful to the person that they have originally married so they are committing um adultery at a human level they are also committing spiritual adultery against god so at a human level they are divorcing the uh, the the wife whom they have you know married and made a promise to stay faithful to so in that sense they are coming committing adultery against the wife of their youth but they are also committing spiritual adultery because they are going after the gods of these foreign wives they are following those foreign gods rather than serving the lord so the lord uh, criticizes them of their um human adultery at the, at the human level and also uh, about the spiritual adultery which they are conduct, committing against him that's the third dispute that the lord brings against them in the book of malachi and then in the fourth book the people they make a dispute and they make an allegation against god and they say oh the lord is not bringing any justice there's a lot of injustice happening in the land and god is not doing anything about it 
and so when they make this particular allegation this is what the lord replies to them that if, that would be malachi chapter 3 uh, verses 1 to 4 um, where the lord says you are accusing me of injustice you're saying that i'm not doing anything about it but the lord says a day will come he says i will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me then suddenly the lord you are seeking will come to his temple the messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come so again this is a prophecy that jesus uh, that god makes about how uh, John the Baptist will come and prepare the way for the Messiah. And then suddenly when the people are not expecting it, the Messiah himself will come into his temple. And, you know, uh, it says he will be like a refiner's fire. So he will purify a people for himself. So he will, he will remove violence and unrighteousness and he will establish justice. So uh, that's regarding the fourth dispute and the prophecy that is connected to that. Um, a fifth dispute which the, um, which the Lord brings, uh, that's regarding the people not giving their tithes. You know, a lot of preaching is done regarding that. So, you know, we will set that aside. The last dispute is basically in Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, where the people say, it is futile to serve God. You know, they basically say, where's the point in serving God? Wicked people are prospering. So if we are wicked, we'll also prosper. We don't have to follow God to prosper. We can become prosperous by following wicked ways. And uh, this is what the Lord says. Um, I think we would actually need to read these verses. So even if we go a little you know, over time, please let us you know, read these verses. Um, Malachi chapter 3 verses 15 to 18. Okay, the reason I'm asking us to read out this is because it very much applies to us. Malachi chapter 3, verses 15 to 18, if someone can read out, please. Malachi chapter 3, verse 15 to 18. And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evil doers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who fear the Lord spoke with one another the lord paid attention and heard them and a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the lord and esteemed his name they shall be mine says the lord of hosts in the day when i make up my present possession and i will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him then once more you shall See the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. So the people of this time were saying, oh, where's the point in serving God? It's a waste to serve God because evil people are prospering. So we can become prosperous by doing evil. Where's the need to follow God and then be blessed? And the, uh, this, is the, uh, you know, this is the words of the wicked people. And then it says in verse 16, then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard what they were saying. The evil people were saying, oh, where's the point in following God? Anyway, even, even, even following evil also will prosper us. But the people who were good, the people who were godly, they were talking something different. And it says over there, God listened to what they were saying. He heard the righteous words which they were speaking. And then it says, a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning these people, you know, who are fearing him. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning them, concerning these people who are honoring his name. So we can be people who are talking and saying, where's the point in serving God? Where's the point in doing all this ministry work? What will come out of it? I'll anyway not get rich. I will not become famous. We can be talking those things or we can be talking righteous things and saying, it is good to follow the Lord. It is honorable to you know worship Him and, and glorify Him. And the Lord listens to what is coming out of our mouths. 
and it says a scroll of remembrance is written for those who are following the lord the lord records the names of those who are speaking the right things about him who are honoring him with their words and their attitudes and the lord says a day will come when i will show compassion to them and i will reward them because they have sincerely followed me so even today in the church we have two types of people we have the grumblers we have the ones the 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 the, the critics who are constantly criticizing god criticizing the church criticizing uh, the work that is being done you know they are the grumblers and god listens to what they are saying and is not pleased and then there are other category of people in the church who are speaking things which will honor god and glorify him and it says that such people he makes a record of them and one day when the time comes he will reward them he will show compassion to them he will you know he will he will make them his treasured possession is what it says in verse 17 and he says on that day people will see the distinction between the evil and the good on that day people will see the way i bless those who follow me and honor me with their words okay so these are all important attitudes which the lord you know touches upon in the book of malachi so book of malachi is something that maybe we should you know um spend a little time meditating upon in our quiet time look at these six things which god talks about how are you in your attitude regarding these six things because these are six things which you need to apply to your christian walk and if you are correct in these six areas of your life then indeed like the lord says he will make you his treasured possession and he will reward you when the time comes so um that's a thought for us to take away you know even as we are finishing this book um all right uh, is there a question here okay yeah um yeah no no question so yeah let's close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for all that we could cover in the old testament um lord we pray that we will be both hearers and doers of your word so all o oh lord all the things that you have taught us so far you enable us o oh lord to apply them so that we will be your treasured possession so that lord even as we honor you in your time o oh lord you will reward us for our faithfulness towards you thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much